Okay, good. Okay, thank you very much for coming here, for joining us at this press conference um, following the third trilogue on the anti-coercion instrument. I welcome the rapporteur for the anti-coercion instrument and the chair of the Committee on International Trade, Mr. Bernd Lange. Mr. Lange, you have the floor. Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, and also from my side, thanks for joining this uh, press point. Indeed, we are living in a world where we see more and more that trade is used as a weapon to force countries to change their policies. And therefore, uh, the European Parliament requested a new instrument. We requested this in October 2020 with a clear perspective that we need more defensive instruments to defend our economic and political interests in this field of weaponizing of trade and investment. Um, the, uh, the Commission made a proposal and um, for me it was not really a wonderful proposal because there are some elements which are not really clear so and there was a lot of room for maneuver of the Commission. So uh, uh, I really decided to sharpen this proposal. For example, with a clear timeline. So in the proposal by the Commission, there was no timeline at all, and such an instrument should not lead to a procedure for what a, a time ever. So we need this instrument in a timely manner. And uh, I, I introduce also some other elements. For example, also clear definition, what coercion means, and also uh, what target of economic coercion could happen. So, for example, we really made clear that coercion could really be focused on a particular act, which is also covering um, expression of positions like the resolution of the European Parliament and not only a specific legislation or political activities. So sharpening the whole exercise. And um, then we saw the council position where my feeling was that uh, this uh, council wanted to weaken down uh, the uh, proposal because, and that's no secret, uh, the Council was not really happy about the instrument at all. Back to October 2020, it was a clear request from the European Parliament to have a common declaration where this instrument was requested and uh, some member states were really skeptical about that and now they really try to water down this. So. Uh, I read in the press uh, this uh, was a danger that it would be a water pistol. I would uh, say the risk would be to have a teaseless t tiger, and this should be not uh, the uh, uh, outcome of such a discussion. So therefore we really discussed with the Council quite intensively and uh, in this third trilog until four o'clock this morning, so this was really a tough um, discussion. So uh, at the end of the day, I guess we got a lot of elements which we introduced to sharpen the proposal. So we have now clear scope, clear definitions, what coercion is, what uh, the target is, what uh, the union interest is, and uh, we have a clear procedure. What is happening under which criteria to get a definition of a coercion, how proceed. Um, and in all the stages of this procedure, the Parliament is clearly involved and informed so that uh, there is no, let's say, room of maneuver uh, in, in a black box. And then, um, besides this uh, sharpening of the procedure, the timeline is also in. Now we have a timeline which really limits the whole exercise for one year. Even this is quite long. And I hope this maximum timeline will not used um, in, 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 in general. But it is a clear signal that this will not 
lead to a never-ending uh, story. And besides the clearness in the procedure, in the timeline, in the definitions, we have also a clear basket of countermeasures if there is a coercion, economic coercion. And this is also important, and as you know, the council wants also to limit the basket of countermeasures. But I think we should really have a basket which is not defined as a specific reaction to a specific coercion. Because then, of course, a country using coercion could calculate which measure might be the answer to my coercion. And this, this should not be the case. We should have the flexibility to react in a specific case with a specific measure. So we have, of course, the traditional measures like customs in, but we have also market restriction, specifically on chemicals, on um, SBS, so agriculture products. We have the export control in, so this is, might be also a, a heavy instrument. And we have also the IPR in, so we can really look to uh, disrespect uh, IPR regulations so for design or whatever. And this is really economically heavily weighted, and uh, therefore we have also the possibility to do it. Um, and then, of course, um, also for us important was to reflect that, of course, the people on the ground, the companies on the ground are affected by a coercion. So we need also to look for a reparation of the injury. And this was also one of the key elements of the parliament. And we introduced this as well. So there are is now, now a framework for the operation of um, injuries. And well, perhaps uh, some, some uh, uh, single items. So, so it's, of course, also important that um, we have a clear competence inside the commission. The original proposal, uh, it was not clear who is com competent for that and how the procedure is followed up. Now we have a single contact point where the competence lies. So there is a, a, the clear uh, obligation for follow-up, the legislation, but also the application and also the coordination between different units of the uh, Commission. So I guess this is also important to make this instrument workable. We will have now an instrument which is not a teethless tiger. It's really a tiger with teeth. It's really not a water pistol, it's a gun. And sometimes it's necessary to put a gun on the table, even knowing that it is not used day by day. So that's also clear. This instrument is the last resort. We really want to avoid coercion. We want to have communication with our trading partners to solve problems. But if there is no possibility, at the end of the day, we have the possibility to defend our economic interests by this instrument. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Mr. Langer. Are there any questions? Yeah. Could you please state your name and your media? First, I think it was it was you, uh, Philip. Um, <coughs> Philip Blankens of Reuters. Um, clearly, there is uh, one obvious case of coercion, which, of course, is you know China regarding Lithuania. I, I just wondered if it would be your understanding that this measure would not be for such a case as in a, like an existing case and would only be for future instances, and, and, and maybe you can give some sort of idea about uh, any other um, possible, uh, you know, uses of uh, or, mm. or po possible um, actions by third countries which you know, this instrument might be useful. I'm not sure that it's uh, only an instrument for future cases. So let's see how the development uh, will be in this uh, case. And I guess this is really a case of coercion using trade measures, stop in and export to force Lithuania to change uh, the um, yeah, respect uh, of the Taipei representation. Um, no, let's see. And uh, secondly, of course, we have several elements. And this is uh, uh, coming really more or less day by day. So now we have also in case of China, so uh, the uh, Dutch government uh, decided not to export 
uh, production machines for advanced uh, uh, semiconductors. And there's a discussion inside uh, China if there will be some retaliation measures to force the Dutch government to change their mind. But also our big ally, the United States, made some uh, comments uh, that they want to establish some additional tariffs on European products if we are establishing a digital tax. Uh, so there are a lot of uh, discussions um, uh, worldwide where countries are thinking about using trade and investment measures as a political weapon. Hi, Janusz Schallenbachermann from Euractiv. Um, just following up, would you argue it, uh, the, the tool should be used now in, in the China-Lithuania uh, case? Uh, and then maybe could you take us through, um, you can take a fi fictional example, like how would this process now work if, if, if a country sees itself coerced? Who would act when mm. and what? who would decide what? Indeed, of course, all um, possible coercive measures should be then uh, under in investigation, also this case. So, first of all, the Commission could start an investigation by themselves or by a request by a serious uh, resource, uh, like the European Parliament or the Council or some other sources. And then they have uh, three months of time to uh, uh, investigate. And then they should present a decision for uh, the determination if there is a coercion or not. And then the decision should be taken. And uh, afterwards, we have uh, uh, some months uh, for discussing the concrete measures. I guess uh, we agreed on six months, if I'm uh, right in my memory or so. And after six months, it should be clear which measures we will take. And then, of course, after the decision of uh, introduce uh, countermeasures, then, of course, these countermeasures should be implemented as quick as possible. So that's the uh, procedure. So, of course, now uh, I guess there will be some cases which will be put forward to the Commission to start the investigation, no doubt about it. Then you. Yeah. Go ahead, please. Thank you. Finn Barr, Birmingham, from the South China Morning Post. My question is about, uh, you, you mentioned in your opening about uh, that um, this could be used in response to uh, retaliation against European Parliament resolutions. Do you have anything in mind, any concrete examples of governments who may have retaliated in a way that would um, require the use of the ACI specifically to a resolution? Not yet, but you know that uh, we have some uh, members which are under sanctions of uh, foreign countries. Um, and uh, at the moment, there is no uh, economic coercion using trade and uh, investment. But who knows? Huh? So it was really important for us that this should be not only focused on a legislative file. It should be on policy in general. And uh, therefore, we have uh, now a huge opportunity if there will be also used uh, trade and investment for uh, uh, coercion in, in, in policy space. Thank you. We have one question from a remote participant, Lea Marshall. If you could uh, press your speak button. Yes, we see you, but we don't hear you yet. We can't hear you yet. If you press the speak button. We still can't hear you. And what about now? Okay, now it's perfect. Go ahead. Perfect, thank you. Sorry, I had to change the source. So, Léa Marshall for Agence Europe. I have a clarification question on the, the timeline you mentioned. So, the, the Commission has three months to investigate and present a decision. And then, could you confirm that the Council, which I understand has to, to give uh, its consent, has three months to, to do so? And so I think we would reach the one year uh, timeline that you mentioned uh, with the, the six months to, to impose the measures. 
Uh, and also a second question on the calendar towards uh, adoption. Um, when do you hope to have this uh, final trilogue with um, really the, the, the definitive agreement um, and the text on the table so that uh, we have a, an adoption maybe for the summer? Is it maybe too ambitious for you um, reaching something uh, by the summer? Thank you. Well, the first part, indeed, the decision should taken in uh, eight weeks, so also quite limited. And if you calculate everything together, then we, you reach uh, one uh, year. But as I mentioned before, let's really push uh, to have it quicker. So it is really a reaction to uh, actual coercion. And therefore, because of this timeline, we could also delete our idea of an urgency procedure. So this was a little bit give and take. We want to have an instrument which we act quite quickly. And uh, therefore, uh, we agreed on this timeline. And therefore, urgency procedures are not necessary. So everything is fixed. Uh, so there is no necessity for further negotiations. So we agreed really on detail on, on all uh, the elements of the text. So just now. Uh, finishing uh, the, the fine-tuning, and then the next dialogue will be uh, only half an hour saying uh, how wonderful the legislation is. I will do it. I'm not sure that the Council will do it, but uh, by the way, you saw perhaps the picture of yesterday evening, uh, after, after uh, or this morning uh, at four o'clock. Um, you can, I guess, see in the face of the participation that uh, the um, reaction on the outcome is quite different uh, between the institutions. So, nevertheless, this will be really short, and uh, I hope indeed that we can finalize this even before the summer break. So, um, it's not such a big legislation, of course, the, the value is quite big, but uh, the volume of, of uh, letter uh, is, is not so big, so the translation would be also not so complicated. So I guess we can move ahead quite quickly. Two more questions. First you and then yeah, Rob. Yeah, just uh, for a clarification question. Um, the, the council will have to give its agreement after the after the first uh, work by the commission, when the commission says it's a coercion or not a coercion, but does the council also have to give an agreement on whether to take counter uh, whether and which uh, countermeasures to take? Like at the end of this yeah. year, this is a comitology procedure. So commission and council and uh, it's normal comitology. Sorry, which one? The, the second the one. The second one yeah. is comitology. Okay. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. I was um, going to ask about the, the fact that you said the council doesn't want this in the first place, but yet the decision-making power will rest with the council as to whether coercion has taken place. Are you a bit worried about that? Uh, obviously, also on QMV, but do you trust that the council will uh, you know, act in, in good faith if they didn't want this in the first place? Yes, of course. Uh, uh, of course, this is not the uh, most liked uh, element of the compromise, no doubt about. But there is some reason behind, because uh, if there is a coercion, then of course, uh, all member states are affected uh, if uh, this uh, leads to conflict with a third country. Um, but uh, this is a specific case. And therefore, we uh, created uh, some, some conditions about, uh, around this. So uh, first, there is a three-party declaration that this decision-making process is unique and only linked to this legislation which has some elements of common uh, um, uh, foreign and security policy. Uh, secondly, we have uh, the deadline for the decision process. Uh, we have uh, the uh, clear obligation for explanation what is going on and we will be in the process. So um, the parliament will be in the process. And I guess this will give also some pressure uh, for the decision. And uh, it's quite unique that uh, we as parliament will be informed on the 
decision by the Commission prior to the Council. So we will know a little bit more about the decision-making process and can, of course, then push the Council. By the way, this is uh, quite innovative, and uh, perhaps we have to rewrite the treaty. Yeah? Thank you. Are there any more questions? I don't see any online. There are no questions either. So I close uh, this press conference. Thanks a lot for coming. Thank you, Mr. Langer, for yeah. coming. Thanks a lot for the time. questions. Thank you.